Sub-Saharan Africa has been undergoing a food crisis for many years now. About 250 million people in the region are going hungry. That's 20% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the key reasons behind this is climate change. Temperatures are rising, sea levels are rising, rainfall becomes less predictable. These are increasing the frequency and intensity of natural disasters. Droughts, floods, cyclones, and other climate shocks, which become more frequent and more intensive, jeopardize the production of food and the resulting food shortages raise food prices for everyone. In this program, safeguarding food security in sub-Saharan Africa. My name is Preeta Mitra. I'm a deputy division chief in the African Department of the International Monetary Fund. I'm also the mission chief on Malawi. I'm Sungmo Choi, a senior economist at the African Department of the uh, International Monetary Fund. I uh, led the chapter on climate change in Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Economic Outlook. And I'm Bruce Edwards. Welcome to this podcast produced by the International Monetary Fund. Sub-Saharan Africa is on the front lines of climate change, with extreme weather wreaking havoc on infrastructure and agricultural production. But COVID-19 introduces another level of risk to the food chain. The latest economic outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa looks at how the region can better manage the types of shocks that threaten its food supply. So it seems that Sub-Saharan Africa is subject to a lot of natural disasters, as you just described there, uh, and this uh, terrible locust infestation uh, being the latest. How much is Sub-Saharan Africa's food production affected by climate change as compared to other regions in the world? Climate change is affecting the whole world. We estimated the impact of rising temperatures and extreme weather events on economic activity, especially food production. And what we found is that this negative impact is larger and longer lasting in Sub-Saharan Africa than elsewhere. To be more specific, economic activity in a given month can decrease by 1% when the average temperature is just 0.5 degrees Celsius above that month's 30 year average. This impact is 60% larger than in the rest of the world's emerging market and developing economies. Then a natural question is why Sub-Saharan Africa is so vulnerable to climate shocks. First, as I mentioned, the region depends so much on agricultural production, which is weather sensitive, but also importantly, Sub-Saharan Africa has lower resilience and fewer coping mechanisms than in other regions. Our analysis shows that taking measures to improve a family's access to finance and access to mobile phones, as well as well-constructed homes and food storage facilities can reduce the chances of a family becoming food insecure by 30 percentage points. Now, speaking of the current locust outbreaks, why the locust outbreaks in the region are so devastating is because of the dependence on agriculture and the low resilience and weak coping mechanisms. Considering these, improved access to mobile phones could provide useful information, even with simple text messages. Um, This could help farmers to protect their crops. Also, greater availability of financing for farmers will allow them to invest in crops that are more resilient to locust outbreaks or weather shocks. So, so the research does lay out several adaptation strategies, uh, as Sungmo just uh, described there, digitalization being one of them, uh, but it comes at a very high cost. 30 to 50 billion per year for the next decade is the estimate. Can countries in the region afford to do this? 
Well, raising resilience to climate change in sub-Saharan Africa, which is critical to improving their food security, calls for a number of measures. Some of these are actually very affordable. Uh, for example, programs supporting farmers in purchasing improved seeds, crop protection measures, uh, implementing early warning systems, and expanding targeted social assistance programs. But at the same time, raising resilience most definitely requires investment in infrastructure as well. Think about mobile networks and irrigation systems, uh, also improving the access to and quality of education and healthcare. These are all expensive undertakings. Uh, and indeed, adaptation strategies are estimated to cost 2 to 3% of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP each year, or 30 to $50 billion per year for the next several years, as you mentioned. Now, very importantly, our analysis finds that financing adaptation, including the infrastructure portion, will be much cheaper than frequent disaster relief. Mm. In fact, the savings in terms of reduced spending on disaster relief will be several times the cost of investing in adaptation. Consider droughts. The savings will be three times the adaptation cost. For storms, it's 12 times. Wow. Now, of course, having said all of this, the question still remains. How will sub-Saharan African countries finance adaptation to climate change? They have limited fiscal space and, in many cases, already high debt levels. So, countries are actively pursuing reforms to try to increase their revenues, including through environmental taxes. Um, they're taking steps to spend more efficiently and to reprioritize investment projects. They're also supporting each other through regional macroeconomic insurance programs. But all of this is not enough. Support of the international community is absolutely critical. Development partners can make a huge difference by targeting resilience building and bolstering coping mechanisms. International financial institutions can help unlock financing. They can provide financing directly through grants and loans or indirectly by guaranteeing loans or by supporting reforms that help reduce the risk of investment for others. So financing adaptation in sub-Saharan Africa will be very expensive, but it will be cheaper than financing frequent disaster relief, and it is most certainly feasible with the help of the international community. Uh, so, so one of the natural disasters that Africa is often hit by are droughts, uh, and obviously, you know, they, they can ravage crops, but it seems the impact goes far beyond that. Um, is there anything countries can do to limit the damage of droughts? Droughts have an especially long-lasting impact, possibly reflecting their prolonged nature. Our analysis finds that the economic impact of a drought in sub-Saharan Africa is about eight times that in emerging market and developing economies in other regions. This is a big concern because one-third of the world's droughts occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Fortunately, the damage can be substantially reduced. As I mentioned earlier, uh, access to finance and mobile phones and well-constructed homes and food storage facilities improve households' ability to confront weather shocks such as drought. But other than that, our analysis finds that medium-term economic damage from one additional drought is about 1% of GDP, and this damage can be reduced by uh, one half if countries improve their uh, access to drinking water, irrigation, and electricity. You know, electricity powers, irrigation systems, and so on. So it is especially important to have uh, diversified sources of electricity rather than relying mainly on hydroelectricity. For example, off-grid systems such as mini-grids and standalone solar systems in Kenya helped to improve access to electricity from 40% to 70% and created many, many jobs. 
No, that's impressive. So, uh, our, our, I mean, we, we've been speaking for many years now of cash transfers as an effective means to support people. Uh, are cash transfers still an effective means to uh, support people during a potential food shortage? And do you worry that funding these types of programs will be harder in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic? Well, actually, cash transfers are a very effective form of social assistance, and their benefits can cascade way beyond food security. Think about Ethiopia's Productive Safety Net Program, which provides cash transfers to the food insecure, and it also requires bank accounts for these transfers. And in doing so, it's actually improved the financial inclusiveness of the country and it's raised the efficiency uh, and in particular how quickly emergency responses to natural disasters are carried through. This combined with improved seeds altogether has lowered food shortages in Ethiopia from 22 to 10 percent in just a five year span. Now, in terms of the pandemic and how it's affecting these cash transfer programs, in sub-Saharan Africa, the coronavirus pandemic has actually accelerated the expansion of cash transfer programs. Hmm. In many countries like Malawi, for example, to help households cope with the pandemic, development partners have stepped up financing for these programs. What that means for households is that the amount... Uh, households under the existing program receive is higher uh, than prior to the pandemic, but also the programs have been expanded. In the case of Malawi, the focus used to be mainly on rural households, and now it's being expanded to urban households, given that urban households are very much impacted by measures to contain the pandemic, such as lockdowns. Hmm. That, that's surprising, actually, in a good way. Uh, and so the pandemic has uh, put pressure on societies in many ways, uh, as you just described there, uh, and around the world. Um, uh, and we're now hearing about uh, possible food shortages in places we could not have imagined only a few months ago. Uh, what would a global food shortage mean for sub-Saharan Africa? Well, um, measures to contain the COVID-19 pandemic Uh, such as border closures, lockdowns, and curfews are intended to slow the spread of the disease. These are critical to saving lives, but at the same time, they are disrupting uh, supply chains. Farmers may not get seeds and other inputs. Foods may not be supplied to the market as usual, uh, and so on. Therefore, the pandemic will probably result in more people going hungry, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. But at the same time, this could be an opportunity. Fiscal stimulus supporting the recovery from the pandemic can be designed to simultaneously raise resilience to climate change. This would increase uh, food security. The final thing I want to add to this perspective is this. Destruction of the environment and biodiversity makes pandemics more likely. Pollution and other things um, driving climate change weaken the health of human beings, which raises their vulnerability to the viruses. So working on climate change could also help to reduce the spread of future pandemics. Thanks to you both. Thank you. Thank you. That was Krita Mitra and Summa Choi talking about food security and climate change in sub-Saharan Africa. The latest regional economic outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa devotes an entire chapter on the topic. You can read it at imf.org. And if you like this podcast, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Twitter at imf underscore podcast. Thanks for listening. 